Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Tom Carrico. I'm a senior fellow with the International Security Program here at CSIS, uh, and I direct the Missile Defense Project here. Uh, I appreciate everyone coming out today uh, for some conversations about the future uh, of air and missile defense uh, and to release one of our uh, new reports on the topic. Before we get to the substance uh, of the event, I want to take a minute to talk about safety. Uh, we don't anticipate any problems, but if for any reason there is an issue, we have to depart. Uh, look to me, find me, and I'll give you some, some traffic control. There's stairs back uh, this way, the way you came in, but there's also some exits in the back uh, if we need it. So we have a full program today, including a panel discussion uh, on the report uh, moderated by Jen Judson, the land warfare reporter uh, at Defense News. But before we get to that, uh, we are privileged to host a conversation uh, with Lieutenant General James Dickinson. General Dickinson is the commander of Army Space and Missile Defense Command, and he also wears the Army Forces Strategic Command and Joint Functional Component Command for Integrated Missile Defense. Before assuming command of SMDC, General Dickinson serves as the Chief of Staff at STRATCOM and the Director of Test uh, for the Missile Defense Agency. He previously served as the Commanding General of both the 32nd and 94th Army Air and Missile Defense Commands at Fort Bliss, Texas and Fort Shafter, Hawaii. General Dickinson has had a long list of command and staff assignments around the globe, including the Republic of Korea, Operation Iraqi Freedom, and Operation Southern Watch in Saudi Arabia. So General Dickinson is going to come up and give his remarks, followed by a conversation moderated by one of his predecessors uh, at SMDC, namely Lieutenant General uh, Dick Formica, who's also on a board of advisors uh, for the project here at CSIS. General Formica is currently a vice president of strategic accounts at Caliber Systems, uh, and before that, he had a distinguished career of 36 years in the Army, where he was a career field artillery and fire support officer. Uh, so General Dickinson, over to you, and then we'll have a little conversation. Well, good afternoon. All right, all right, a little quiet today. Hey, thanks for that uh, uh, kind introduction, uh, Tom. I, I gotta tell you though, uh, sometimes when people get up here and do the introductions, the longer it goes on, the older I feel. So, uh, so I do appreciate that uh, brevity today in the introduction. And uh, again, I'm very pleased to be here today uh, and, and get an opportunity to talk with a great crowd here today of uh, folks that uh, hopefully have the passion and I believe the interest that I have in missile defense, particularly Army Air and Missile Defense. So today I want to talk about Army Integrated Air and Missile Defense, where we are today, where we're going, and new operational concepts. My command, as Tom stated earlier, the United States Army Space and Missile Defense Command, Army Forces Strategic Command, is unique in the Army. Our diverse and specialized set of missions and functions possess position us ideally to perform the function of AMD Enterprise Integrator. The Army AMD force is globally deployed and regionally engaged as a key strategic enabler for the joint force and the nation. As potential adversaries increasingly hold the U.S., our deployed forces, and our partners and allies at risk with an evolving array of missiles, unmanned aerial systems, and long-range rocket and artillery capabilities, AMD modernization efforts and initiatives must in fact continue to avoid adversary overmatch. I will briefly cover several topics that have contributed to a very dynamic past year for the Army AMD enterprise, as well as what looks to be an increasingly challenging future. These include evolving threats and AMD challenges, recent AMD enterprise accomplishments and initiatives, multi-domain battle, Army Integrated Air and Missile Defense, which I'll refer to as AIAMD, and how we are approaching some future operational concepts highlighted in the CIS, CSIS Distributed Defense Report, and finally, the evolution of our AMD strategy. So as I begin, I'm gonna take a few moments to highlight just a few recent events that illustrate the evolving air and missile defense environment. Since 2011, Kim Jong-un has launched a total of 89 missiles. To put that in perspective, his father launched 16 missiles during his 17 years in power, and his grandfather launched 15 missiles from the inception of the North Korean Ballistic Missile Program in 1984 until his death in 1994. 21 of Kim Jong-un's launches occurred in 2017 alone. 
Since 2016, North Korea has tested a submarine-launched ballistic missile, a new solid-fuel MRBM with a mobile launcher, a new IRBM, and its first ICBM. Iran has conducted six ballistic missile tests and one space launch test in 2017. In September, Iran revealed its new Karamsha MRBM in a military parade. And finally, we see unmanned aerial systems being used tactically in new ways in Ukraine and Syria, and the global information warfare environment is rapidly changing. Our AMD systems will encounter more complex electronic, cyber, and directed energy capabilities that could significantly degrade U.S. missile defense operations. And we cannot lose sight of the emerging threat posed by hypersonic glide vehicles and maneuvering ballistic missile warheads. So as we see other countries steadily working toward expanding their threat capabilities, the Army AMD enterprise faces the added challenges of the changing operational environment, the demands of the current fight, and how we balance them with modernization and the narrowing U.S. technological advantage. The operational environment is becoming more complex and multi-domain focused. We are now facing multiple challenges, including global terrorism and increasing activity from North Korea has been prevalent in the past year. Many countries are beginning to simultaneously operate and exploit opportunities across all warfighting domains. Today, the Army's top priority is readiness, a fight tonight mentality and approach with more than 50% of the AMD force globally positioned and regionally engaged. Army AMD forces are fully integrated and conducting operations in support of CENTCOM, UCOM, PACOM, and NORTHCOM, and the demand continues to increase. We are implementing several key initiatives to address these challenges, to include establishing an institutional air and missile defense test detachment this year, fielding five dismounted Patriot Information Coordination Centrals this year, and normalizing AMD rotations from 12 to nine months which we expected to achieve in the near future. Balancing modernization with the competing operational demands of supporting the current fight is a significant challenge. High op tempo requires these modernization efforts be synchronized between the operational and institutional parts of the Army, as well as stable funding, because schedule changes in one area will absolutely have second and third order effects across the AMD enterprise. Last, we can no longer assume a decisive technolo technology advantage. Our adversaries are closing technology gaps with the advancements in electronic warfare, directed energy, hypersonics, UAS, cyber, and space capabilities. We must continue to aggressively improve our kinetic capabilities and pursue technologies that expand our left of launch capabilities while implementing a more su sustainable and cost-effective approach. Next, I want to take a few minutes to highlight some recent AMD enterprise accomplishments and initiatives, and I'll note where some of the distributed defense concepts described in the CSIS report fit into what we are doing today. We demonstrated our ground-based mid-course defense and expanded its capacity. In May 2017, MDA successfully intercepted an ICBM target during FTG-15 flight test and increased the number of ground-based interceptors by 14 last year for a total of 44 today. MDA also plans to conduct the first GMD salvo operational flight test in FY19 and we anticipate the addition of a long-range discrimination radar in the 2020 timeframe that will add to our BMDS sensor architecture. We provided high altitude capability to enhance the missile defense posture in South Korea. The United States and the Republic of Korea worked cooperatively this past year to deploy the Terminal High Altitude Air Defense System to South Korea, strengthening the alliance's layered missile defense. We continued to advance our interoperability. The, inter the Army Integrated Air and Missile Defense Program of Record is the Army's answer to the network centrism concept described in the CSIS report. This program will integrate AMD capabilities by transitioning them onto a highly flexible and agile common AMD mission command network. 
The IAMD Battle Command System, or IBCS, is the material solution for the Army Integrated Air and Missile Defense Program. IBCS includes the IBCS Engagement Operations Center and the Integrated Fire Control Network Relay, which integrates and networks AMD sensors and launchers. This concept is designed to link current and future Army and ultimately joint AMD Mission Command nodes and sensor and launcher platforms together on a common network, providing the network centrality required for the future AMD fight. The Army Integrated Air and Missile Defense Program will also address the element dispersal concept described in the CSIS report. The IFCN and Net Central C2 provided by IBCS will provide the Army with improved flexibility by allowing AMD capabilities to be deployed on the battlefield. For example, instead of deploying an air defense battalion, as we do today, the Army will be able to deploy sensors and shooters on the battlefield tailored to the operational environment. We continued our Patriot modernization efforts. The Army is in the process of delivering the next Patriot software build, post-deployment build eight, or PDB-8, to its 15 Patriot battalions. Patriot modernization remains on schedule with units receiving configuration three plus upgrades to include PDB-8, modern man station upgrades, radar digital process configuration, missile segment enhancement, and new equipment training. We also initiated a CSA directed man pads pilot program for short range air defense or SHORAD for maneuver forces in third quarter of last year. This is a Chief of Staff of the Army's number one AMD priority. This, the initial SHORAD capability consists of ground maneuver man pads teams trained to protect the maneuver force. An interim SHORAD capability may be recruited through industry in the very near future. We are on track to deliver two Avenger Battalion equipment sets to Europe in FY18 in support of the European Deterrence Initiative. The equipment will be followed by personnel and infrastructure to establish an active component of Avenger Battalion in FY19. We will begin annual rotations of an Army National Guard Avenger battery to Europe this year, along with the scheduled brigade combat rotations, combat team rotations. We are making progress on counter UAS capabilities. The Army's Fire Center of Excellence completed a counter UAS strategy at ConOps last year, and we are developing and testing new capabilities to include high energy lasers, electronic warfare, and high powered microwaves, among other potential cost effective solutions. We are addressing the mixed loads concept in a number of ways. In the CSIS report, the layered defense in a box refers to the ability to fire different interceptor types from the same launcher system. The Patriot launching station provides this capability today, allowing the flexibility of loading a mix of either Patriot MSC, PAC-3 missile, missile interceptors, or a mix of GEM and PAC-2 interceptors onto the same platform. We are developing the multi-mission launcher which looks to expand this capability by allowing interceptors of different family types, AIM-9X, Stinger, and other counter UAS and short range interceptors to be launched from a single platform. And finally, we are engaged in standing up a new ADA cross-functional team under the development lead of the ADA Commandant. We recognize that we need, to be more, that we need more innovation and agility in our research and development. The CFT concept is to develop a requirement informed in appropriate cases by experimentation and technical demonstrations through teaming, agility, and rapid feedback to enable the development of a capability document and expedite the decision-making process for a potential program of record. Next, I'll discuss some emerging technologies and capabilities. As an enterprise, we seek to develop, acquire, and integrate emerging technologies and capabilities that provide a technical edge against the threat. I mentioned the Army Integrated Air and Missile Defense Program a few minutes ago. It is designed to provide that technical edge and is the AMD enterprise's top modernization priority. We are developing a new radar capability called the Lower Tier Air and Missile Defense Sensor, or LTAMS. This sensor component of the Army's IBCS will address the Army's requirements for a Patriot air and missile defense radar replacement. 
The program is currently executing a concept definition phase in preparation for a milestone A decision. The Army has awarded contracts to multiple companies to come up with concept designs that help address critical capability gaps, modernize technology, reduce operation and support costs, mitigate obsolescence, and increase reliability and sustainability. Another example of emerging technology is directed energy, which has the potential to be a low-cost, effective complement to kinetic energy options. Our mobile experimental high-energy laser which is a striker equipped with a 5 kW laser, participated in the maneuver fires integration experiment at Fort Sill and successfully engaged various targets, including UAVs. We are looking at options for equipping a striker with more powerful and capable lasers. Our high energy laser mobile test truck is currently being fitted with a new 50 kW laser and will participate in major demonstrations this year. The laser is a risk reduction effort in the development of the high energy laser tactical vehicle demonstrator, a rugged and mobile tactical platform that can effectively engage a wide range of targets. We expect to conduct 100 kW laser testing with this system in FY22. The offense defense launcher system mentioned in the CSIS report is a any launcher, any mission concept based on a launcher system that can, blow, that can deploy both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground munitions. This is an interesting concept. The Army is actively pursuing what we call left-of-launch solutions for many different threat sets. The term left-of-launch refers to any capability that affects the enemy's ability to employ ballistic missiles to include cyber, space, and air capabilities before they have missiles in flight. The Army has several capabilities that address the multi-mission shooter or any missile, any target concept mentioned in the CSIS report. Currently, the Patriot MSC and PAC-3 interceptors provide this capability as they are highly effective against rotary and fixed-wing aircraft, unmanned aerial systems, cruise missiles, as well as a wide variety of tactical ballistic missiles. The underlying issue here is cost. Patriot interceptors, as we know, are very expensive, and many threats that I've just listed are very inexpensive and highly proliferated, causing a disproportionate cost curve where a multi-million dollar missile may be used to defeat a few hundred dollar threat. Multi-domain battle. Multi-domain battle, a joint combined arms concept for the 21st century, includes warfighting capabilities of the physical domains and places greater emphasis on space and the information environment to include cyberspace and the electromagnetic spectrum. The Army's development of the multi-domain task force is an initiative that may change the Army in the future, and AMD will be an integral capability providing ballistic missile and short-range air defense capabilities. The intent is to integrate organic and joint counter-air, counter-fire, cyber and space capabilities to ensure joint force freedom of action at the earliest stage of deterrence and conflict. The initial concept was approved in 2017 and the United States Army Pacific-led pilot program is be being conducted over the next couple of years. So to be successful, AMD commanders must coordinate and integrate four operational elements, or pillars, of theater missile defense. Passive defense, active defense, attack operations, and battle management, command control, communication computers, and intelligence, or BMC4I, to protect contingency for deployed and reinforcing fires, as well as designated theater strategic assets. More often than not, Passive defense is overlooked in discussions of AMD modernization and new technologies. Two of the IAMD operational concepts addressed in the CSIS report are related in that they both address passive defense measures to increase the survivability of air defense launcher assets. The first concept is containerized launchers, an any launcher anywhere concept. The second concept is called the passive defense shell game, a some full many empty concept. Today's AMD missiles are fired almost exclusively from vehicles, trailers, or silos. While these platforms are mobile, in some cases, they are also easily recognizable. The containerized launcher concept looks at moving launchers from their vehicles or trailers and putting them into nondescript cargo canisters. 
Although this concept is not optimal for maneuvering forces, it does add concealment and deception to AMD capabilities for fixed assets. Concealment and deception is also exploited in the passive defense shell game, wherein AMD forces would deploy many containers, some with launching systems and many without. Using identical containers as decoys could support survivability and the resilience of the AMD force while adding strategic flexibility. In general, passive defense measures can help us exploit the disproportionate cost curve I mentioned earlier to our advantage, forcing an adversary to expend assets on uncertain targets. So before I close, I'd like to talk about the evolution of our AMD strategy. Our current AMD strategy, published in 2012, is derived from the overarching Army guidance to prevent, shape, and win. It provides an overarching framework for achieving the stated AMD vision and ends of the defend the homeland, defend the force and protect critical assets, and ensure access for our forces. The AMD enterprise accomplishes the desired outcomes by pursuing four lines of effort. Attain network mission command, enable the defeat of the full range of air and missile threats, build partner capacity, and maintain forward presence and transform the AMD force. The strategy guides and directs the AMD enterprise to integrate across active and reserve components, operational forces, modernization proponents, research development, test and evaluation efforts, and material development. In 2015, my predecessor signed waypoint number one to the 2012 Army AMD strategy which provided an assessment and update of the Army AMD force and a bridging strategy to a more comprehensive revision. Based on the recent national defense strategy and the Army operating concept, changing operational environment, evolving threat, and emerging technologies, the Army AMD enterprise began the development of a new AMD strategy in March of 2017 to be completed by summer of this year, 2018. This new strategy will focus on the 2018 to the 2028 timeframe and nest with the national defense strategies, the Army operating concepts, multi-domain battle, and other current doctrine. It will include a holistic .mil PF review and address all domains from mud to space. So as we develop our next strategy, we continue to refine our vision for the future AMD force. Our AMD vision is consistent with the vision for the 2020 Joint Integrated Air and Missile Defense Strategy, wherein all capabilities, defensive, passive, offensive, kinetic, non-kinetic, are integrated into a comprehensive joint and combined force capable of preventing an adversary from effectively employing any of its, any of its offensive air and missile weapons. In terms of mission command, we envision a single common AMD mission command network that is central to our future capability. IBCS will be integral in providing that capability. AMD must contribute to a single integrated air picture to provide relevant situational awareness, early warning, and prevention of fratricide across multiple joint operations areas simultaneously. We must move beyond the sector line of sight engagements and move toward an integrated fire control capability and sensors that provide 360 degree coverage and weapons that can conduct advanced engagements in any direction to defeat increasingly advanced threats. We must also be able to defeat advanced countermeasures such as early release submunitions and electronic attack. AMD should, Army Air and Missile Defense, should evolve from a system centric to a component-centric capability, which will allow us to focus R&D to quickly produce the specific components or capabilities rather than complete systems, which are time-consuming and very costly. And given the increasing global threat, we must continue to integrate and leverage joint and partner nations' capabilities to the maximum and prudent extent possible. We envision a force that will continue to be forward positioned to respond as the operational environment changes. So in closing, the AMD enterprise is making steady progress in a continually evolving threat environment. We need to maintain forward momentum to stay ahead of the threats our Army, joint forces, and allies are facing. 
AMD forces will be integral to implementing multi-domain battle concepts and developments in multi-domain task force. We must get it right. The capability requirements, force readiness levels, and our ability to meet combatant commands demands. Operational concepts like AIAMD will provide combatant commanders with unprecedented flexibility in deploying AMD assets. Given the involving global threat, leveraging joint and allied integration is essential and we must continue to emphasize and advance interoperability and integration through operations, exercises, foreign military sales, and other security cooperation mechanisms. We must develop and field breakthrough technologies that advance AMD enterprise capabilities, address critical shortfalls, and provide cost-effective solutions. It takes DOD, industry, and academia working closely together to achieve this. The development of the AMD strategy 2018 to 2028 will provide the foundation for the future AMD force and will be informed by current national strategy, the MDR, operating concepts such as multi-domain multi uh, operations and threat environments and the ever-emerging technological landscape. Finally, I'd like to leave you with a thought about our space and missile defense soldiers, sailors, airmen and marines who are ever vigilant performing the 24-7, 365 mission around the world. More than half of our air defense forces are either forward deployed or forward stationed around the world, protecting U.S. forces and our allies. They are engaged with our allies, advancing interoperability and integration through operations and exercises and other security op uh, cooperation opportunities. Our men and women are highly technical, professional warriors who are always prepared to answer the nation's call. I'd like to extend my appreciation to the CIS President, Dr. Hamry, for the missile defense efforts here at CSIS, and also to uh, Tom for your efforts uh, on your, uh, your report that we're going to discuss later. And I appreciate the opportunity today to get to speak with all of you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome. I'm glad you could be here. It's nice to see so many familiar faces. Um, and there's uh, no doubt that uh, General Dickinson uh, would merit such an audience uh, to get after the thoughts that, uh, that he's facing or thinking every day in the, given the challenges that he's facing. Jim, thanks for uh, your very thoughtful remarks. Um, I couldn't help but notice that you covered everything from the environment to include the threat uh, to the strategic landscape uh, and then exactly what you all were doing uh, in SMDC and at JFCCIMD, and so I appreciate that thoughtfulness. Um, it is a little unusual, I think, to have two SMDC commanders having a conversation in front of 250 or 300 of their best friends, um, so I appreciate your willingness to do this. Uh, from my perspective, as we were preparing for this, I couldn't help but think how pleased I was to have a soldier and a, a space and missile defender of General Dickinson's capabilities in the seat, doing the things that SMDC is doing, leading those great soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and civilians, and truly facing the challenges that come up every day. From his perspective, he wanted to know why I was asking questions about things I should have fixed on my watch. So that'll be my default answer. <laughs> <laughs> and we've practiced that. He's going to ask me why I didn't fix it. Um, to that end, um, this is an interesting time to be in space and missile defense, um, not only because of the threat and the strategic environment, but the emphasis that that places on space, the space domain, missile defense, uh, and we'll get in a little bit today as well, some operational fires. The national defense strategy is recently out. It highlights missile defense, uh, and it talks to the challenges in the space and cyberspace domains. The chief of staff of the Army is pretty uh, straightforward on his priorities in terms of readiness, modernization, and taking care of soldiers and families. And when he talks to modernization, he's got six priorities. Two of those are operational fires and air and missile defense. And 
General Dickinson alluded to the air and missile defense priority already. So uh, there is plenty of attention in this, in this uh, uh, capability area. Jim, I would tell you, everyone in this room is interested in the missile defense review. But you and I know, and as you stated in your remarks, that's currently under review, and we're not going to ask you to get out in front of the leadership, so we'll take that off the table for today's discussion. But the National Defense Strategy was recently released. Uh, it addresses the same five challenges that the previous strategy had, uh, had addressed. Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, and terrorism. But its context is different. And it states that interstate strategic competition, not terrorism, is now the primary concern for U.S. national security. For missile defense, it specifically identifies that the investment focus will be on layered missile defenses and disruptive capabilities for both theater missile defense and North Korean ballistic missile threats. Can you speak about how this impacts the uh, Air and Missile Defense Force? Well, I think it's a great question. I, mm -hmm. I think it gives us some, some great uh, momentum in improving our capability to have a layered defense. Uh, in my remarks, I talked uh, briefly about you know, what we have done to bring SHORAD back into the maneuver, maneuver force through uh, first man pads, man portable air defense, uh, teams coming back into the force that we've currently trained and now are putting into place in Europe and then followed closely by the reintroduction of Avenger back into the force to provide us a capability uh, that we need right now. And then with the future of m ad coming along and then the follow-ons to that with potentially high energy lasers and things, high powered microwaves, things that I talked about in my remarks, that really kind of provides that, if you will, that short range air defense capability that we we haven't had for many years. On top of that, we are seeing now that we've got Patriot and THAAD and theaters together, and that THAAD capability has come into the operational force, we have an opportunity for a layered capability between Patriot and THAAD, and then of course, also with, uh, with Aegis uh, BMD. So as we look to the future with layered missile defense, it's important that we keep in mind as we, as we go through that it all must be integrated all must be interoperable and we must be able to use the best missile for the best against the best threat or the best interceptor against the threat so that we are more efficient or we're as efficient as we can be and uh, using missiles uh, so that we're not using too many missiles against the threat but we use the right number with the right systems and what's going to tie all that together will be IBCS as it comes into the comes into the force here in the not too distant future that will provide us that capability of true integration and interoperability in the sense that we'll have the best shooter and the best sensor uh, doing an engagement and that will bring us to that layered, complete layered uh, defense. But I think overall the language gives us great uh, uh, momentum in going forward to make sure that we're accounting for all that and planning and bringing that to the warfighter. During your remarks you mentioned LTAMs and the 360 degree radar. Can you talk to how that fits into the layered defense? So uh, quite simply, you know, the radars that we have today with THAAD and Patriot, for example, are, uh, are directional. Uh, we used to have capabilities uh, many years ago that we had 360 capability, Hawk weapon systems, those types of things. We do have a little bit of that with uh, a Sentinel radar, but right now we're pretty much, you know, wherever you're situated, you've got a few degrees on other, either side of that primary target line where you can do acquisition engagements. A 360 capability gets to addressing the threats that we see now with cruise missiles and with rotary, fixed wing, and, and UAS type threats. So bringing that, that capability into the Air Missile Defense Force, plugging it into the IBCS network, uh, the IFCN network, will give us that capability. You also mentioned in your remarks, you talked about building partner capacity and allies. The national defense strategy talks to um, the requirement, the imperative to strengthen and to maintain strong relationships with our allies. Um, what are your thoughts on interoperability? There's lots of challenges with interoperability and missile defense for a lot of various reasons. Um, any comments on uh, interoperability as we move forward? 
So I think, uh, first of all, we've, we've got to have that integration with, with our allies and partners. And uh, for, the, for the units that are out there around the world, I kind of talked about at the end of my <coughs> remarks, they do it every day. So they're, they're working with our partners and allies all around the world and doing air defense training and exercises and trying to do that hard interoperability that's required so that we do bring the right mix to the fight and to the threat. And so I think as we go down the road, as we look at future capabilities, we always have to make sure that we're looking to the eye of or to the area of being able to integrate our partners and uh, allies into that system, into that architecture. When I was sitting where you were and interoperability came up and the need for uh, bringing allied capabilities into the fight, one of my concerns always was that um, while there's clearly a need for interoperability and to bring that additional capacity, my concern is that at the time was that that would result in a notion that, well, we won't need as much as air and missile defense capabilities uh, from the U.S. forces as we bring in more allied capabilities. And my concern with that is I'm not sure that there's ever going to be enough and that having bringing in allied capabilities merely allows you to mitigate the risk that the combatant commanders are facing. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I tend to agree with you. I think, you know, you've got to have, I mean, you have a lot of our, a lot of these countries now that have, uh, you know, the same weapon systems we do. It just doesn't make any sense that they would be in that geographic area and we're not interoperable with them. We're not controlling fires. We're not doing positive identification. We're not doing those things that uh, are incumbent upon us to make sure that we are conducting operations that support the combat commander. So uh, I don't think it's a, a, a matter of uh, lessening our commitments in places around the world. I think it's just making them better and more mature. Thank you. Um, one of the other areas that comes up from time to time and that uh, I certainly like to have the conversation about is the recognition that missile defenses alone aren't going to be enough to protect against the missile threats that we face. Offense defense integration is required. Um, we'll never get there with missile defense alone. And in fact, in our air and missile defense doctrine, we, and you mentioned it in your remarks, we talk about not only passive defense, active defense, but attack operations. Uh, what's the Army doing to move towards better and improved offense-defense integration? So I think uh, my answer to that would be what we're seeing uh, in the development of the multi-domain task force, multi-domain concept. So as we look at that and we start experimenting with that a little bit in a concept, we're looking at having offensive fires in the same organization as you would have uh, defensive fires. And to, in addition to that, you would have not only that kinetic capability, but also some non-kinetic capabilities that could exist in the cyber, electronic warfare, and the space, uh, in the space area. So I think putting all those into a single organization with a chain of command, uh, leadership chain of command that can incorporate all that together and those types of capabilities will bring that uh, non-kinetic and kinetic ability to do offensive and defensive fires. Do you see sometime in the future that becoming a norm for um, fires uh, f organizations? I think we're moving that way. Because yeah. I think it just makes sense when you think about the problem set that you have with a, uh, a missile defense, a missile engagement, and you, the, the problem being that what happened to where that missile originated from, you know, who's to say, you know, as we look, the, the reload rate and you're just going to continue to have that problem. So if you integrate it with an offensive fires capability, you might be able to help yourself a little more with that problem. Yeah, it just strikes me that at least currently where we are with technology and technological developments um, and as the forces look at how they um, establish their doctrine, organize and train, um, at the brigade level, we may be getting close to that and this is for, for Micah's opinion, um, probably at the battalion level where the technology, technological requirements are still pretty clear and specific, both not only in field artillery and fire support on the one side, but the specific capabilities of air and missile defense on the other side. So at the battalion level, I'm not sure that we're quite there yet. We may be getting there at the brigade level, but 
um, it's interesting that we're talking about this because organizationally we can see we're moving in that direction. You talk about the multi-domain task force. Um, some would advocate that at the brigade level we should start moving in that direction, someone like me. And then you have, uh, like the report that we're, the panel's gonna discuss later, talks about having a launcher that can do both. Um, I like to say we're about one technology away from really having um, an integrated offense defense integration, but I'm not sure how long it is before we get that. Uh, but until then, I think that there are some organizational solutions that might let us get after that. Um, in terms of offense defense integration, uh, I know SMDC's had some uh, work in the development of hypersonics. Any comments on hypersonics and how that might play into this? Well, I think hypersonics uh, will could easily play into this, uh, just given the uh, the capability that brings to you in terms of uh, speed, accuracy, uh, threat, I think uh, that definitely could be part of the future build for that. Future fix, yeah, certainly. Um, a little bit about the Army's acquisition process. Uh, we know that uh, everybody loves talking about that. Um, the advantage we have today is we know that the leadership of the Army is looking to establish an Army Futures Command or something of that ilk. Um, again, I know that decisions haven't been made, so I'm not going to ask you to get out in front of the Army and talk about the Army Futures Command per se, but it's already, the Army's already established cross-functional teams as a way to begin to address the challenges in the acquisition process. Uh, can you share your views of how cross-functional teams will improve the acquisition process and how that will relate to Army Air and Missile Defense? So the cross-functional teams are to, the intent is to improve upon the acquisition timeline. And so what I mean by improving upon the acquisition timeline as I made in my, the comment I made in my remarks is, you know, streamlining that timeline from a concept to a requirement, a requirement to a program of record, program of record to a fielded warfighting capability. That is really the gist of what we're trying to get at with a cross-functional team particularly in air and missile defense with the, uh, the ever-changing threat and as quickly as it changes, we've got to have a more agile way of identifying potentially breakthrough, uh, breakthrough technologies or see technologies that we can take into that process and mature it much quicker than we do right now. So I'm, I'm optimistic for it. I think we've got a couple of good ideas that we're looking right now at uh, the AMD uh, cross-functional team and I think what we're going to see at the end is we're going to see the ability to move quicker with a more agile, smaller group of folks working that acquisition timeline that'll, that'll produce more quickly a field of uh, capability to the warfighter. And, and I would just add, because we had the conversation on offense, defense integration, I think it's also important to note that of the six cross-functional teams, one of them's on operational fires. So um, as the Army's moving forward and advancing its um, and improving its acquisition process, both elements in this offense-defense integration equation are being addressed by cross-functional teams. Mm -hmm. uh, I, might, I might add, too, yeah, in my other hat is the Space Missile Defense Commander. So space, while not a, a uh, one CFT or cross-functional team, is actually spread amongst all six of them. So as you can imagine, space has something to do with every one of those cross-functional teams. And in my, my role as a Space and Missile Defense Commander, we are absolutely interested in participating in that as well. So do you have space capabilities or space soldier, soldiers or civilians integrated in those cross-functional teams or responding to them? Responding to them. Uh, in a couple of cases, we have dedicated people inside the CFT. Yeah, I think that's good. One of the things that, again, as space becomes more and more understood in terms of the capabilities that the Army brings. Um, you know, when I was sitting where you were, we were putting LNOs out in the TRADOC centers of excellence to make sure that they, we were having that conversation doing doctrine development, and we were establishing um, an Army training strategy. The fact that you're now integrating into the acquisition process is a sign of tremendous progress and how Army space capabilities are A, better understood, and B, better integrated into the rest of the Army. So yeah, I applaud that. 
And so from the work that you did to where we are today with the Army Space Training Strategy is uh, we, have, we have completely immersed ourselves into the CTCs, the combat training centers, the home station trainings. We are at the schoolhouses uh, training soldiers on Army space and what it is to uh, fight in a contested, denied, and degraded environment. So it's only getting, getting better in terms of training soldiers on, on how to react or operate in those types of environments. Great. Um, in your remarks, uh, you referred to some of the concepts that are articulated in the CSIS report, how the Army's already making um, incremental moves in some of those direction, not quite as advanced as some of the concepts in the, in the paper. Um, any comments, uh, on, and, and we know the panel's gonna get into that in much more uh, detail next. Uh, any other comments you'd like to make on the report? Well, first of all, I think it's great that we have, we have great intellectuals that are out looking at these concepts and uh, socializing them and uh, debating them. I think it's very uh, powerful for the community overall. I mean, that's how I think we start moving forward more quickly is with folks kind of on the outside looking on what's going on on the inside. Because, uh, of course, you know, we, we, from time to time we get a little busy. It's always good to have somebody else looking in and uh, having the community at large, you know, look at these concepts and uh, you know, socialize them and participate in uh, forums like today, I think are very powerful and, and help us as an enterprise, as a community move forward. Well, it's not specifically addressed in the paper, but you talked about the UAS threat and directed energy. Um, uh, one of the areas of technology that I think the command has been at the forefront uh, for, for the, of the Army in pushing that capability forward, even against sometimes resistance um, when people dismiss it as, oh, directed energy is always just five years away. Mm -hmm. um, some of the successes that have come up that you mentioned at, the, at Fort Sill and in others, um, talk to the capability currently against UAS and I think the potential down the road. Uh, any additional thoughts that you'd like to share on directed energy and, and where we're headed? Well, I think we're making great progress in that area. This last year was, uh, for us at SMDC was very successful in the, the testing of our 5KW uh, high energy laser on a striker combat vehicle. Uh, one test at White Sands Missile Range, then we've had two tests at uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, the maneuver fire experimental exercise, and uh, very uh, encouraged with what we, what we saw out there. We, we uh, have tested it in terms of the technology piece of it, and then we've also tested the TTPs that it will take to train soldiers on how to do it. And, the, and training the soldiers to do it is a very short timeline to, to get them to a level where they're very proficient at using the weapon system. So we're looking at it from you know, the material development to the operational piece with the soldiers doing it. And we've had very encouraging uh, results uh, this past year. Now we're going on to a, a bigger laser, as you can imagine. So we're going, as I mentioned in my remarks, to a 50KW. Uh, that we'll uh, eventually try to put onto a striker combat vehicle. And of course, you know, five to 50K gives you quite a bit improved capability as you get a little bit bigger, higher power. I'm gonna, I don't, I won't, I don't wanna put you on the spot too much, but I do wanna ask a question that related to that. Um, getting 50 kilowatts and having that power, that's always been a, a challenge in how quickly we're gonna be able to get to there. Um, and certainly that will bring added capability. Um, I was at a, a conference a couple of years ago, and uh, I can't remember his name, but one of the speakers on a panel from the Navy talked about incremental fielding of directed energy at the Navy and putting out smaller uh, or lower levels of uh, directed energy just to get it out, get it fielded, get it in the, uh, get it in the units, and start uh, using it for those threats that it was capable against. Has the Army had any thought to, to doing that or how would you react to that? So that's similar to what we're doing in the sense that, you know, our real pathfinder was the 5KW. So we, as I mentioned, we demonstrated that, had success with that. The next step is the 50K and our, our uh, uh, objective is for the IFPIC increment two is to have 100KW out in the 2020. 2022 time frame. So it is, it's, a, it's an incremental thing because as you, as you go with the smaller and then you go to the medium and then the large, you're learning things along the way. 
you know, that, that are very complicated with lasers, heat dissipation, uh, power, those types of things. So as you, rather than go all the way to the objective, which would be 100 kW or more, you want to, we want to learn along the way to make sure that we understand how to get there. And uh, we're able to do that at an earlier time. I would be encouraged if we start fielding units with that and start employing the capability. I'm not sure that we're thinking that that way yet. We're still looking at uh, getting it onto the striker yeah. right now, but of yeah. course that would be something that would be interesting. Okay. Uh, Jim, again, one of the advantages of having two former, or one former and a current, I didn't mean to imply anything there. Uh, <laughs> Do you know something I don't? No, it's and, and 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 this is going very well. So there's nothing there, uh, but a former CG of SMDC and and a current is um, there's not a lot of folks in the Army who truly understand the capabilities that Space and Missile Defense Command brings and the relationship that it has um, with JFCC IMD, what the command delivers to U.S. Strategic Command the other geographic combatant commands. I'd say that over the last several years, that's gotten better as space and missile defense capabilities are demanded by the combatant commanders and by the maneuver forces. And that makes the role that SMDC plays in the Army and in support of combatant commands even more important. Um, for me, it was a huge learning experience to find out what those capabilities were. Is there anything that stands out for you in terms of the unique capability that the command brings uh, and what it means to the, to the warfighter? Well, first, it's a, I think the first thing I realized uh, it was how geographic dispersed the command is. So if you, if you look at the footprint that the command has right now, we, we span 12 time zones and 20, more than 22 locations around the world in all the areas that you would imagine. Uh, and then the niche capabilities that the command brings to uh, the warfighter, STRATCOM, and many of the other combatant commands in the areas of communications, in the area of missile warning, in the, in the area of space. And we, and we talked about the Army Space Training Strategy, but we have, we have space soldiers that are integrated into core division, brigade combat team levels, providing space ex expertise all around the world. So that, to me, was one of the big was the big takeaways was the fact that the command is is geographically dispersed and doing some incredible missions for uh, for the for the United States and I didn't even mention missile defense so when you look at uh, what we do in terms of the 100th missile defense brigade and what they do 24/7 365 for the protection of the uh, of the United States continental United States against a limited uh, missile attack it's amazing so uh, we've got great people doing great things around the world, and uh, I c it continues to amaze me. And every chance I get, I make sure that I, I let the senior leaders see the command. Uh, not a large command. It's about 2,700 uh, folks in total, which for an uh, Army Service Component Command, that's a rather small one. Uh, but, uh, again, we, we do some amazing things. Um, I can't help but note, I mean, that the command has both space and missile defense. The integration of space and missile defense is another one of those things that I think we learn. Um, how have you seen that play out uh, in the uh, operations and in the exercises that you've participated in? Well, one of the things uh, that uh, I realized after being in command for a little while is every time we have a real-world missile launch um, that almost every part of the command is touched. So we talk about the 100th GMD, of course, uh, that would be, but when you look at missile warning, communications, as well as some other space assets that we have. It's, it's amazing that every time we have a missile launch, almost the entire command is exercised from the operational side to the institutional side. So that piece of it is pretty very interesting. Uh, Jim, in your closing thoughts on your remarks, um, you specifically called out the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and civilians that stand watch uh, every day. Um, as we wrap up this, um, any closing thoughts that you'd like to, to share with the audience? Uh, sure. Well, I mean, as I mentioned in my remarks, you know, I think every time we talk about material solutions, research and development, you know, capabilities uh, that we need to bring into uh, to the warfighter, we can never lose sight of who actually 
we're doing that for, and that is for the soldiers and the sailors, the airmen and the Marines that operate the system and those that they defend using that system. So I think it's very important that we remember that. Uh, my command is a very uh, unique command in the fact that I have all compos represented in the command, both on the space side as well as the missile defense side. So I've got National Guardsmen, reservists, as well as active duty working side by side every day, sometimes on the same crews. Uh, whether you're a missile defense crew or you might be a missile warning crew or you might be a space crew. So uh, I would just leave you with we've got great young people doing this every day around the world for us. So, again, I appreciate being here today. Okay, well, I, I would uh, wrap this up by saying, one, thanks for your leadership and for all that your command does and what it brings um, in support of our warfighters and in defense of our nation. I know these are challenging times to be the CG. Uh, and I applaud you for what you're doing. And I'd like to add my thanks to CSIS for establishing a forum like this, for letting us have a conversation for the panel that's gonna follow, and as you said, for the innovative thinking that's going on in this building uh, and that you'll see in, in this report. Agree with the concepts, disagree with the concepts, debate them, but uh, those kind of innovative thoughts coming from here um, really advance the discussion, and that's what's going to move uh, missile defense technologies forward. So thanks to all, and thanks for you, thanks to all of you for being here and for your attention tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I think we'll uh, get started. It looks like there's only a few people still milling out in the coffee area. Yeah, um, welcome and thank you for attending now, this panel right on distributed right defense right and new operational and concepts for integrated air and missile defense. Kind of I'm Jen Judson, land warfare reporter at Defense News. Um, I'd like to introduce the panelists. Starting directly to my left, we have Vince Sabio, the program manager for the hypervelocity gun weapon system at the Strategic Capabilities Office. Retired Rear Admiral Arch Macy, who is a non-resident senior associate at the Missile Defense Project here at CSIS. Brigadier General Clement Howard, Coward, the Director of Joint Integrated Air and Missile Defense Organization, and Tom Carrico, the Director of the Missile Defense Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Tom Carrico for some opening remarks, and then I'll open it up for the rest of our panelists to open as well. Well, thank you, Jen. I appreciate your, your, your moderating. Here to uh, summarize our new report uh, entitled Distributed Defense. And I want to thank the whole uh, CSIS missile defense team, including Wes Rumbaugh, Ian Williams, Sean Shake, uh, as well as a number of outside reviewers who, who took a look at this as it was coming along. Uh, before too long, the Pentagon will release its new missile defense review. Uh, given indications in both the national security and national defense strategies, uh, one may reasonably expect an increased emphasis on homeland missile defense. Uh, recent budget movements uh, also reflect an urgency of not allowing North Korea to outpace missile defense efforts, uh, ballistic missile defense efforts for the homeland, and that kind of is reflected especially in procurement. All of that makes uh, a lot of sense given the activities of North Korea over the past few years. But a, another central feature of the national security and defense strategies uh, is the candid and forthright articulation that we now face renewed great power competition, meaning not just North Korea. And so that's going to require some different thinking. This reorientation will have many implications uh, for how we think about forward bases and forces, but it might also benefit uh, from further attention to fires, uh, including but not limited to air and missile defense fires. After all, a missile, he missile heavy threat set already forms the backbone of many A2AD capabilities that challenge American power projection. Now, go to a typical panel discussion in DC or elsewhere about the future of missile defense, and you'll hear mostly a discussion of capacity and capability, uh, meaning bigger interceptors, uh, more capable ones, bigger radars, uh, and more of all of that stuff. And it'll probably focus on ballistic missiles. But as we heard from Lieutenant General Dickinson just now, uh, it's not just about ballistic missiles anymore but the spectrum of ballistic and non-ballistic threats from more actors and in more sophisticated uh, employment concepts. We've seen forms of air and missile battle at the hands of Russia and Ukraine, uh, and even by Iran and Syria, not just swarms or salvos, but in the form of structured and combined arms attack. And in the face of such complexity, robust and integrated air and missile defense has never been more important. So in this report, we tried to ask a question. What comes after integration, and how can IAMD be adapted and applied to the circumstances of great power competition? So while we find this here, while the U.S. has been consumed with counterterrorism, Russia and China have been going to school in the American way of war. Now we know we can't get full spectrum dominance, but what we can do is make it a lot harder for them to harm or suppress our forces. About three years ago, the distributed lethality concept was emerging for the Navy with a focus on distributing strike systems to anything that floats so as to complicate the surveillance and targeting problem of the bad guys. And more recently, the set of ideas has been emerging for the Army and Marine Corps, namely multi-domain battle with a characteristic focus on maneuver. Now, as the former head of U.S. Army Europe, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges said, I think in an interview with Jen Judson, that any conflict in Europe, the U.S. would be facing a lot, lots and lots of missiles. And so it therefore seemed a little bit odd that for all the talk about multi-domain battle and doing things differently, there wasn't all that much talk about how to actually transform uh, and adapt air and missile defense. Uh, in the initial uh, multi-domain battle white paper, for instance, the only mention of air defenses was of adversary air defenses. Now, you heard Lieutenant General Dickinson say that it is becoming more integral. I think that's a very good thing, and that the CFTs are going to be uh, trying to encourage that. That's good. 
But the current efforts for integration in the program of record established and long underway may not be enough for the near peer uh, focus. Getting patriots and thads to talk to each other, making defenses smarter and more efficient is necessary but probably insufficient to be more survivable. It's not just that there isn't enough integration, but it isn't going fast enough. At the current rate, we're lucky to achieve former uh, General Dempsey's Vision 2020, maybe by the 2040 timeframe. So what's the problems exactly with the joint force? In the first instance, it's stovepipes of excellence. Vertical rather than horizontal integration, lack of communication and shared air picture between systems as well as services. Second, a big one, too many single points of failure, especially in terms of uh, reliance upon radars. That's a picture right there of a North Korean drone that was picked up, found in a tree, and crashed uh, in the summer of last year. Uh, we found it uh, in South Korea, and it had a video camera. It was surveilling the THAAD missile site in South Korea to figure out where everything was. Now, had that drone had an IED on it rather than a video camera, and had it gone into the face of the Tippy 2 radar and, and decapitated it, no more THAAD for the South Korean Peninsula, single point of failure. That's closely related to the third shortcoming, an underfocus on non-ballistic threats. It's not that ballistic missile defense has had too much attention, but that everything else had perhaps had too much. That means gaps and seams like this one. And you heard before how the Army is scrambling to catch up on SHORAD, uh, cruise missile defense, and other forms of fires for missile defeat. Of course, high cost of really capable interceptors uh, and just not enough to go around uh, is another feature. And finally, too much reliance, as we heard from General Dickinson just a bit ago, on sectored ground-based radars. They're limited by what they see. They're limited by the Earth's uh, curvature. Uh, it's great if you know exactly where a threat is coming from. Not so great uh, for other things. And the bottom line here is that today's air and missile defense force is all too susceptible to suppression. I don't say that lightly. But if we're serious about multi-domain battle and the near-peer threat, it's going to take more than just doing more of the same uh, in terms of incremental improvements for capability and capacity. So to get at this, we try to come through uh, seven concepts or approaches, what have you. And not to bury the lead, but think of this as distributed lethality taken ashore and applied to ground-based fires with an added dose of passive defense. The first and the foundation of all this is networked integration. Uh, you heard about that a little bit ago, so that a Patriot or Thad or Stinger can fire off a Sentinel or F-35 as opposed to their co-located organic radars. This is a daunting challenge. You know, GMD, for instance, had to pull together a global uh, network of radars that weren't designed for the job. That was a tough thing. It's analogous, uh, not the same thing uh, to this challenge. The Navy has been doing NIFCA uh, and cooperative engagement capability, and that's a bit of a model here. They're a little further ahead. The idea is how can the Army uh, get some of that uh, launch on remote, engage on remote kind of capability. That's all good, but we ought to ask what comes after. And one of the first things we heard about uh, is uh, element dispersal and the ability to redefine uh, a firing unit. Being able to spread things out but still pull together actively all those elements would, make, would allow for more flexible defense building and survivable elements. Remote fire control also becomes more interesting. That's an iron dome right there. Remote fire control allows you to, to fire it uh, without having a lot of manning uh, on site. Now, the key and potential, the key here, but also the potential limit uh, with dispersal is the sensors. Whether the elements are dispersed or not, however, we're going to need a lot more sensors in a lot more places with a lot more redundancy and looking in just about every direction for this spectrum of threats. The third is mixed loads. Now, we heard a little bit about how Patriots have a little bit of uh, mixing and matching in terms of different kinds of Patriots. Uh, but for the most part, Patriots are fired from Patriot launchers, THADs are from THAD launchers, uh, and so on. The main exception that proves the rule, the MML, is still in development. And it's going to do a lot of interesting things. AIM-9X, Stingers, Hellfires, and that sort of thing. But it's for the shore rad and low-end uh, counter UAV mission. Another model here that perhaps, you know, the the characteristics are of the Aegis uh, VLS, where all manner of ESSMs, SM6s, SM3s, it's a layered defense in a box, 
right? And that's, I think, perhaps the goal here. But you could probably be doing a lot more mixing and matching uh, like the MML, but for the higher end uh, capabilities. Next uh, concept uh, that, that I think could be elaborated a lot upon is uh, offense-defense uh, launchers. Now, we heard a little bit from General Formica about how we might get a little bit at the brigade or battalion level, but maybe you could even push it down uh, to a single launcher. So a single entity or a single unit of some kind might have some air defense and sea ram, but perhaps have the ability to shoot back uh, in some way. Here again, the Aegis VLS is a bit of a model uh, with both offense and defensive effectors side by side uh, in, in tubes. Another aspect of this is multi-mission shooters, taking this down all the way into the airframe itself. Besides co-locating strike and defense in tubes side by side, still further flexibility comes from this multi-mission ability. The SM-6 is a kind of poster boy for this, having acquired not merely anti-air, cruise missile, uh, terminal ballistic missile, and even anti-ship capability. But the Tomahawk Block 4, the ESSM Block 2, uh, and even the Army ATACMS has also gotten some of that uh, multi-mission uh, interest. And that's, that, 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 I think, is, could, be, could be taken still further. There's probably a limit to how far that can go, in as much as you don't want to use scarce and very expensive missile defense assets for strike, uh, but it's the sort of thing that can continue to be pursued. And then finally, we get to uh, containerized launchers. You know, Vision 2020 called for a robust embrace of passive defense. And here is the idea is to get away from merely trucks, trailers, and silos and move to, which are after all pretty identifiable, uh, even if they're transportable, and move to something else. One way that we throw out there uh, to be provocative is to, is to box them up in very standard looking cargo containers, mill vans. It's not without, and then put them out there in an unmanned remote fire control kind of way. It's not without precedent. Uh, the Future Combat Systems program in the 1990s had something like this. And whatever problems one had with FCS, I think the concept uh, is, not, uh, is not without merit. Small, modular, containerized and unmanned missile launchers distributed around for both offensive and defensive fires. And we take a little picture of what that might look like. We just use a, a Patriot for, uh, for notional purposes, but you could put many, many wonderful things uh, into a box. And this is what it permits. Uh, it's not merely intermodal transportation and flexible uh, basing, but it permits a shell game to support survivability. Uh, it's not just camouflage or driving Patriot trucks around in circles. Uh, that can help, but moving smartly around the battlefield is not going to hide their distinctive signatures. Even a launcher that shoots and scoots might be tracked. So, imagine a military base with the Polish countryside littered with hundreds of innocuous, maybe moderately rusty cargo containers. Some would contain missiles, but most would be empty and an adversary bent on attacking would have a heck of a time distinguishing between them. And the, con the container decoys, they wouldn't just be empty, but they'd be equipped with various optical, thermal, electromagnetic, and logistical signatures. We wouldn't make it easy on them to figure out which was which. All this would increase uncertainty, and in the event of a crisis, encourage adversaries to expend resources on surveillance or encourage wastage of their PGMs. This also would not be a replacement from mobile or relocatable launchers, but rather a supplement. And containerized launchers hiding in plain sight might be especially well suited for defending fixed sites where mobility is less necessary or less possible. And furthermore, a large number of containerized launchers would not be necessary for them to serve some of their purposes, and frankly, to serve the deterrence purpose. Once the capability was publicized, perhaps in the lobby of a defense trade show, or perhaps even demonstrated at an air show, an adversary would have to begin taking into account, would have to expend funds on uh, surveillance, and would have little way of knowing when, where, or to what extent they had been deployed, perhaps deployed on the territory of our allies. So let me connect this with the NDS, which just came out. By taking principles of distributed lethality and applying them to ground-based fires, the distributed defense approach is designed to adapt especially army fires to the sophisticated threat environment that's presupposed by multi-domain battle. And this, I think, fits pretty well with the, with the injunction of the NDS 
to be more operationally unpredictable, to pursue disruptive capabilities for some of these missile uh, challenges, and, and finally to go after a more dispersed and resilient force that includes both active and passive defenses. So our adversaries have gone to school on us. Perhaps it's time to go to school on them and attack not merely uh, with more capability and capacity, but to attack their theory of victory. Thank you very much. All right, um, Vince, why don't you uh, take your turn now? <laughs> sure. Um, thank you, Jen. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so as Tom noted, the, our adversaries have spent several decades going to school on, uh, on U.S. missile defense uh, architecture policy approach. And they've developed multiple means of, uh, of uh, working around and defeating our current missile defense architecture. We're all too painfully aware of this. There are three, in SCO, we kind of see three key issues with the current missile defense architecture. Um, as noted, it's brittle. It's designed for a specific type of threat, a ballistic threat that's coming in. It's inflexible. It's designed for that threat to be coming in or those threats to be coming in on a very specific set of axes. We're aware of that and, and a very specific set of elevations. And it's expensive. And the end result of expensive is we have limited buys of, the, uh, of our interceptors. Um, we have limited deployments of our, uh, of our uh, IAMD sites. And as a result, the adversary is able to count interceptors. They know where the sites are. And they can simply play what we call the plus one game. They know if you have X number of interceptors, the absolute most that they need to throw at you is X threats. And once you have fired your X interceptors, they pretty much own you from that point forward. So the, the, the architecture is substantially problematic, and we really need to rethink that architecture. And the, uh, the IAMD report that, that Tom has released really gets to some of the key uh, topics that we need to get our arms around and grapple with as we go forward to the next generation IAMD architecture. So key parts of that. When we talk about brittleness, the, uh, the fact that the current architecture is designed for ballistic threats. We need to get away from ballistic threats, They're from just ballistic threats. There's cruise missiles, there's HGVs. We need to be able to address those types of threats. Subsonic, supersonic, sea skimming, land hugging, coming in from above and dropping down on top of us. There's, there are many different uh, uh, trajectories that we need to be able to deal with that we cannot deal with today, or at least cannot deal with effectively today. There's the, uh, the, lack, the, there's the, rigid, the rigidity or the lack of flexibility in the architecture, the fact that we're looking across a limited number of azimuths and a limited range of elevations. We need to drop down to the deck for those sea skimming or land hugging cruise missiles. We need to be able, we need to get up to 90 degrees to be able to engage those things that are dropping down on top of us. And we need 360 degree coverage because as we know, our adversaries are exploiting our limited azimuthal coverage by developing weapons that can come in and engage us on multiple axes. All of these are problematic and at the same time, as we deal with the, the brittleness and the rigidity of the current system, we also need to address cost. Now, in a sense, that's saying we're going to take all three corners of that triangle and we're going to optimize all three of them. And there are ways that I believe we can do this. But cost, as you know, has very substantial implications. When we talk about uh, very expensive uh, interceptors. When, for example, there's a substantial amount of discussion and analysis just on our shot doctrine. That really underscores the cost of the current architecture when we're talking about should it be shoot, look, shoot, shoot, instead of shoot, shoot, look, shoot, in order to help conserve those interceptors. We're talking about conserving interceptors. Why? Because we have so few of them and because our finger pauses over the fire button 
just because we know every time we push it, we're pushing a fair amount of money out of that launcher. So we need to get to a, a less expensive architecture, and there are ways that we can do that. So how do, how do we start to approach these three issues? Uh, in SCO, we've taken uh, several different approaches. First and foremost, we need to be able to engage multiple threats or multiple axes. Um, the, uh, as an example, several years ago, SCO took the, the very well-known Navy SM-6, which is a uh, air defense weapon, and we modified that to also be able to do surface to surface. So we're kind of blending the offense and defense. We can work it the other way. Inherently offensive capabilities can also can be modified to have inherently defensive capabilities as well. This also complicates our adversarial planning. They know right now we have defensive capabilities over here, we have offensive capabilities over there. They know how to plan for that and they know how to engage each of them independently. But if those capabilities are each both offensive and defensive, we now complicate their planning. So that's one angle that we need to, uh, to, to consider is merging offensive and defensive. Um, we need to be able to engage multiple threats with a single weapon. And while that sounds like a terrific thing to do, it's actually within the realm of the possible. So as noted, when Jen introduced me, I'm the program manager for the hypervelocity gun weapon system at SCO. Um, this is a, a small, flexible, hypervelocity projectile. That projectile is being designed to, be, to engage multiple threats. There may be different modes that it operates in, and we may program it, or we may tell it shortly after it comes out of the gun uh, which type of a threat it's going after, and it'll configure itself for that type of threat in terms of the dynamics. How does it maneuver? How does it close on the threat? And whether it engages a KE warhead or whether it goes into a hit to kill mode. Those can all be based on the threat and we can tell it as it's en route to the threat, here's what you're going after, this is the mode that you're going to engage in. And there's a fair amount of history here too. I'll take you all the way back to the first Gulf War and the Pac-2 Patriot missile. Back in the first Gulf War, if you think about the Patriot missile, the Patriot missile, it's, it's air defense mode. It's, it's what at the time was called the anti-tactical missile mode, ATM mode was designed for the Soviet SS-21. This is a short, fast, screamingly fast missile, surface-to-surface -surface missile It's coming in. The, the Patriot was designed to go up against that SS-21. When we took it out to the Gulf Theater, and I say we, I was part of the, the Patriot Fuse team at the time. When we took it out to the Gulf Theater, we were going up against SCUDs. SCUDs, big, dumb, slow, lumbering surface-to-surface -surface weapons, truly. And the problem was that we were, it, the, the way the, the range gates were designed on that weapon, we were designed, it, it was intended to engage a screamingly fast, S, small SS-21. It was never designed for something like a SCUD. So how did we engage the SCUDs? It had one of the first digital fuses on it. This is a breakthrough in fuse design at the time. What we did was clock down the fuse so it thought more slowly. So it, as it was thinking more slowly, it's passing along the side of the other missile. I won't go into the whole engagement philosophy, but Patriot Pac-2 was not hit to kill. Uh, got alongside the threat and it had a, uh, a, a HE frag warhead. Uh, so all we did was slow down its thought process so that it had more time to get alongside, ideally, the, the warhead of the Scud and take out the warhead of the Scud. And yes, we knew that parts were still going to come raining down, right? Gravity still works, what goes up must come down. But it actually did work very, very effectively for engaging the Scuds. Now, we could, very simply, if we go all the way back to even just the Pac-2, we could tell the Pac-2 on launch, you're going up against a Scud. That tells it it needs to either slow down the fuse or enter in some type of a delay. Um, those, are the those are the ways that we need to be thinking for being able to engage multiple threats. And there are lots of different <coughs> ways that we can do this. Um, and finally, when we get to cost, right now we, 
we're, we're working in a mode in which we have missile interceptors that are designed with PKs that are PSSKs, the probability of a single shot kill that are very, very high. It's expensive to build these weapons, it's expensive to test these weapons, it's expensive to validate these weapons, and by God, it's expensive to shoot these weapons. A layered defense with a sensor architecture that reaches out farther allows us to engage farther out with lower PSSKs, but a higher ensemble PK, we can take multiple shots at the, uh, at the threat as it's coming in, but also engage it with different types of interceptors. And again, coming back to the hypervelocity gun weapon system, we have a projectile. That projectile has been independently costed, not by me, I wouldn't expect you to believe my costing, but has in, been independently costed by Navy IWS at about $85,000 a round. That is way, way, way cheaper than anything that is currently in the US missile defense architecture. You can shoot a lot of those things and not feel badly about it at the end of the day. The other beauty though about an $85,000 round is you can buy a lot of them. You don't have to buy six of them and put them out where your adversary <coughs> can count silos or missile tube covers. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, now I know what I have to shoot. These are stored in Connex boxes. And just as Tom was referring to with, uh, with containerized missile launchers, where, yes, you can put mis missile launchers in containers. You can distribute a bunch of containers around, and it's not clear which ones have missile launchers in there. Some do, some don't, who knows. But you can do this with your projectile inventory as well. The projectiles are stored in Connex boxes. You litter them around the base. You've got a bunch of other Connex boxes. Some have MREs, some might have missile launchers, some might have nothing at all. They might have pet food, who knows? But the point being, you're able to obfuscate the depth of your magazine, and that is absolutely critical. It takes away from the adversary the ability to play the plus one game. And then finally, we need a true hemispherical coverage for defense. We cannot allow our adversaries to simply fly around our sensor systems and come in and attack us on an axis where we're blind. That's, that's just not acceptable as we move forward. So the uh, 360 degree coverage, and there's a lot of ways that we can do this, and it doesn't have to be obscenely expensive. Yes, if you want to take a THAAD radar, and drop it down to the deck and move it up to 90 degrees and provide yourself with 360 degree hemispherical coverage or full hemispherical coverage from a THAAD radar, yes, it is going to be prohibitively expensive. There are less expensive ways that we can do this. On the hypervelocity gun weapon system, we are right now building a, uh, a, an interferometer that will provide us with nearly 180 degree, well, more than 90 degree coverage, let's, let's put it that way. And the cost for the first article of this is just over $23 million. So the, uh, and we get down to the deck coverage and nearly 90 degree coverage just out of the first article. And there are ways that that can be modified to provide the full 90 degrees. Now, um, you can take four of these. You've got a reasonably cost-effective full hemispherical coverage for fire control. That is a, that's a fire control quality radar. We're pairing that up with a uh, modified Marine Corps ANTPS-80, the Gator radar. That's a rotating radar that provides our surveillance capability. It reaches out farther than the fire control radar, finds the threats that are coming in, does it on a three, all 360 degrees. It can do stop and stare if we need it to, if we need to get the incoming threat into a basket to hand off to the fire control radar. Now you have complete hemispherical coverage to, to support that IAMD architecture. And finally, and what I think is one of the key points, those projectiles that I'm talking about for HGWS, now, this is part of a layered defense, but those projectiles that I'm talking about for HGWS are shot out of Army 155 howitzers, and they're shot out of Navy 5-inch deck guns. You have the ultimate importability. 
any place that you can take a 155, any place that you can take your, uh, your Navy DDG, you have got an inexpensive, flexible air and missile defense capability. And also for both the Marines and the Army, a new concept, which is essentially air and missile defense on the move, or in a Marine sense, expeditionary air and missile defense, something that the, the military currently does not have and fundamentally needs. As we learned in the Ukraine, when there is something coming over that hillside that wants to take a look at your position, understand where you are, how you're distributed, what you've got, and they're gonna follow it up with something lethal, you want to be able to make that UAV go away and you wanna make it go away now. And you wanna make it go away before it gets anywhere near you. Having an expeditionary air and missile defense capability that can provide that type of, of protection is going to be key to battlefield survival moving forward. So these are the types of approaches that we're taking within the Strategic Capabilities Office. Um, essentially addressing the, uh, the rigidity of the system, the, uh, the lack of flexibility in the system, the range of targets, and also the cost. Getting down to, again, that $85,000 per round. It's not going to solve all your problems. You still need a range of, uh, of capabilities. You need a layered defense to provide the, the full capability against all incoming threats. But this starts to now move us toward a future capability that is uh, survivable and affordable. All right, thank you very much, Vince. Um, Arch? Yeah, um, thanks for a few minutes to talk about this. Uh, I enjoyed reading the report. I thought it was a bunch of good ideas. Uh, I would assess it's a good coverage of what IAMD really needs to be about and all the different facets of it. Uh, nothing I object to, and I applaud Tom and Wes for listening to me over the years, <laughs> and to Pat, and to Ken, and to Jesse, and to Clem. So maybe we all had something to help out. Um, so some, a variety of thoughts. Uh, Three opportunities that I see that this affords, um, or ways of looking at it. One is external coverage area. Um, it's a fact of physics that your ability to intercept things, uh, a given threat, is based partially on where you're launching from. Um, and by allowing the ability to open up the locations of your launch sites without having to dig very expensive holes in the ground, or equivalent type efforts, you can vastly increase your coverage area. Um, it allows you true multi-mission capability per site, which people have been talking about. Um, among other things, um, it's easier to disguise what's there. It's easier to, as perhaps the threat changes over time or the uh, operational scenario changes, it's easier to change out what you may need for that different scenario than having to bring in a whole nother unit that's you know, man trained, tasked, and equipped to do it. You can just bring in some different stuff. And as everyone has brought up, it does vastly complicate the counter-targeting problem, whether it um, uh, is uh, a missile or pet food, uh, is a significant challenge to deal with. Um, and you can extend that a little bit. We're talking here about mostly for ground application, which in the European theater would, I think, certainly be the driving force. That's not necessarily true in the Pacific theater, where, as most of us know, it's vastly more water than land. And extending this to the distributed lethality, distributed fires of the Navy, um, there's no reason you couldn't put this on ships, whether it's cargo ships or amphibious ships, um, which is part of what Admiral Rowden and Admiral Gamma Tau Tau came up with for uh, distributed lethality, which is what if every ship out there is lethal to an opponent? Because they're carrying something that can reach out and hurt people. And there's no reason this couldn't be part of the carry. Um, so that's interesting. I think there's three challenges that need to be uh, considered. Um, two are just kind of practical, but they can be a real challenge. One is moving and protecting this stuff. Um, if you're going to have it inside military bases, that gives you some advantage but then everyone knows what military bases are. 
So if you'd like to have it somewhat less obvious, then you're going to have it outside the base. So how do you get it there? Um, and then how do you protect it while it's there? You don't just want to be littering the countryside with mill vans with expensive equipment in them and then walking away or having you know, two guys standing there in overcoats trying to protect that they're going to uh, pretend they're going to be able to actually protect this thing. Um, I just did an, an interesting sort of thing. Um, if you look at uh, some of these concepts, um, a mill van, like Tom brought out, is allowed to have 26 tons gross weight. That's the structural design. Um, a SM3 is one and a half tons and a THAAD is one ton. Okay, so that means that, you know, there's, with equipment and everything, how much can you <coughs> put in there? Maybe four, maybe eight, don't know. Um, by the way, if anyone's got any bright ideas, a GBI is 23 tons. So you're probably not going to do a lot with GBIs in those containers, even extended versions of them. Um, and as I said, you're going to have to come up with some sort of concept which is going to take soldiers or airmen or marines on land to protect these things, um, to make sure they're available, they're operational, and that the presence of that protection doesn't give it away. Either that or you're going to have a bunch of people guarding mill vans with pet food in them. And I'm not picking, but he brought up, I'm not picking on his example. It's a very good one because that complicates the issue here. Mm -hmm. um, there is, going back to my, one of my previous jobs as Chief of Naval Ordnance, um, you're going to put these things in there in these boxes and you have to start thinking about explosive safety. Because usually when we cite things that have explosives in them, we think a lot about how far away you're going to have other stuff and we build bunkers and berms and things like that. Um, a, uh, an SM3 has uh, about 1,800 pounds net explosive weight per missile. That means you need a kilometer or two distance from it if something bad happens. And so you're going to have to think about that, particularly if you want to put it out in the countryside, um, either in our own country or more perhaps difficult in a foreign country. Where are you going to put this thing? And then, so, you know, a container with uh, four SM3s um, comes up to something on the order of 7,000 pounds in that explosive weight. Uh, that will get people's attention. Um, incidentally, for people who like doing those things, for all of these missiles, you want to know the net explosive weight. If it's a solid fuel, it's about 60% of the total weight of the missile. So you can do it back of the envelope. There's nothing classified about that. That's basic engineering. So we have to handle if we're going to use these things, where are we going to put them? Is it going to be in the back of the Walmart parking lot? Um, and do we get Walmart to agree to that? Uh, it's not a minor problem. And if you're going to move them around the countryside, that's OK. They'll fit on, on rail cars. Um, as long as you keep to the standard mill van length or the double van, if you go longer than that, then you've got a problem because cars aren't long enough. Um, so we need to figure out where we're going to do that. Um, someday, if we think about putting these things on ships, um, our launchers on ships have built-in fire suppression and protection and all that kinds of thing. You, know, you put a mill van on the back of um, you know, a Maersk Lines freighter, um, they're not equipped for that. You also have to think about which way it's pointing. Because when you launch this stuff, as all the missileers in the room know, there's a whole bunch of flame and smoke that comes out, which you don't want to be around and you certainly don't want to breathe. The stuff is terribly poisonous. So those can become issues for employing either on a ship or in the back of the Walmart parking lot. Not to say you can't do it, but it's the kind of thing that's going to have to be thought of and will drive force structure, requirement, and operations. The last part which I would just like to highlight, and I'm mostly throwing out questions and challenges because I don't have the answers, is employment planning and C2. Uh, General Dickinson talked about where the Army's trying to work their way through that with IBCS and a number of things. Uh, the Navy has NIFCA and, and CEC and so forth. But if we're really going to do this in a joint fight, and I believe that it will have to be, to be successful, a joint fight, it has to be a joint capability to integrate sensors, C2, and effectors. If we really mean any target, any sensor, any launcher, then that means everyone participating in that, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, has to be involved in the, the information flow, the decision trees, the logics, and the employment decisions. 
What is the command structure and tasking method for that? Right now, we do not have a COCOM method to conduct IAMD. Each service does it on its own. Even the um, air component commander is spending his time worrying about strike packages and defensive fences, not worrying about how you put together and employ a range of weapons across the Army and the Navy primarily, Marine Corps and Air Force sensor systems in order to protect the joint force in different parts of the battlefield. So what is the command structure? What's the tasking method? Does it change from area to area? Is it different in NATO than it is in Southwest Asia? I would submit yes. So we need to think about how that will fit in. These concepts are going to drive, I believe, some pretty significant changes in not only doctrine, but in C2 structure, if we're really going to realize the capability. And something that comes up sort of after the fact is this is all pretty cool. We're going to be able to take a whole range of weapons from two services, maybe three, a range of sensors from four services plus three letter agencies and other capabilities, which will give us a lot of capability. But then where are we going to and how and who is going to develop <coughs> the modeling and simulation and the mission planning tools to be able to use this? You say you can move these boxes around. Well, for different threat scenarios or different strategic scenarios, where do you want the boxes? Do you want it in Walmart or do you want it 200 miles down the road? Because remember where I started, that matters on what you will protect. So where is your critical asset list? Back to the old basics of that. And what are you going to protect? So where are you going to put these things? And what are the tools we're going to give the operational units, the commanders, the soldiers, and the sailors to do that planning, to make those decisions? Um, we're not going to have time to call home to the old heads up, like the guys up here, um, the long-range planners, the strategy guys, to say, well, what do you want us to do with this thing? So those, those need to be uh, developed. Um, we're making a lot of progress. I think there's some really good ideas. I think this program, this report, is bringing up a bunch of stuff people should think about. Uh, I want to uh, stop with two, two observations, or two, two points. One is, let us remember that the fundamental purpose of integrated air and missile defense is not to win the fight. They can't. The fundamental purpose of integrated air and missile defense is to defend critical assets, land and forces, and allies long enough to end the fight by other means. Many people have heard me say that many times, and I submit that that is an unassailable point that needs to be understood. <coughs> so what that says is you have to have offense-defense integration. You should not be at the point where as he said, you're worrying about X plus one. You are taking the fight to the enemy as soon as the fight starts. So the enemy can have X plus one or X plus 400. He's going to get X over two off the rails and towards you. You have to be ready and capable in an integrated offense and defense capability in order to accomplish that. Or it doesn't matter whether interceptors cost 85000 or $85 million and how much money you've got. Air and missile defense as part of the battle is not playing catch. It is protection long enough to win the war by other means. And finally, just on a personal note, sitting next to my successor, four people removed from where I started, I would observe that this is the phased adaptive approach taken to the next level. And with that, I'll turn it to General Coward. It's a good segue, Art. Appreciate yes, sir. It. So the first phone call I got, I think after I got signed or nominated for the job, and, uh, and was, uh, was from Arch Macy, and it was really, really appreciate that. And uh, so I appreciate the opportunity to leave the Pentagon. It's nice to, to be away, and, and hopefully if we stay here long enough, I don't have to go back this afternoon. Okay, and so that's the plan. <laughs> so you guys ask enough questions to uh, kind of hit that sweet spot, so we don't have to, to head back. And, and <laughs> And I asked to, to speak last because, you know, these gentlemen are, are so, so damn smart, and I mean that. Because uh, I pick up something, I wrote some notes down myself here on some things that I picked up on. Um, but I'll certainly take it back down to the grassroots and a little bit more of the operational level uh, from, from, from where I sit and try to look at this thing through the operational lens. Um, 
I told my staff, I said, would I, would I rather be in the middle of a desert, cold right now, or on a Patriot site, forward deployed with, with, our, with our men and women? Absolutely. Um, but this business is hard, and the, the, the scenarios and the description that they provided just a few minutes ago, each of them, is really hard stuff. And I have some of my, my contemporaries in the room here that I work, some of the stuff in the building. And if we could click our heels and say, okay, let's just make it happen, then, then it, would, it wouldn't be that hard to, to figure out. Um, but I kind of go back to, you know, General Milley said it back at the AUSA conference, and he laid out six Army priorities, and I'm speaking really with my, my joint hat, but, I, but also certainly my 28 years in the Army doing this stuff. Um, and he laid out six Army priorities from, from uh, long-range precision fires to vertical, feud, vertical lift capability, as well as uh, close combat support. Um, and then he said, well, look, you can't do any of that stuff if you're dead. And his point was, you know, we, the importance in, in the priority of, of missile defense certainly, ha certainly has reached the, uh, the forefront of the department. So just a quick highlight, I wear three hats. And, uh, you know, Art did the same thing when he was there a few years ago, kind of went away, and, and we've downsized on the joint staff. And I pay attention to three different areas with the protection role that I have. Really, my, my description really, or my title is the Deputy Director for Force Protection. So I look at Chem Bio Defense and, and the way that program is resourced and palmed. I look at protection, and it's about personnel and, and asset protection, but right now we've been spending a lot of time in counter UAS. And, and that is something that really is, is changing the whole dynamic, even what we're talking about today, of today's operational environment. And this has the, the incredible interest of uh, the Secretary of Defense. We've provided him about four answers to RFI's request for information of over the last two weeks because of his interest, not, up, not even just operations overseas, but in the homeland as well as uh, in host nation. And then the last one is what I'm here today really is to talk about how we integrate missile defense. How do we advocate for the combatant commanders? How do we advocate for the services? How do we tie all of this together with OSD, the Missile Defense Agency, and really to facilitate that collaboration? And we've got to focus on both not only, we, we talked a, a little or probably a lot this afternoon already about the future, but I still have concerns about the short term. And if you watch the news, you don't have to watch too much of it to understand what's going on in the Pacific right now. We probably spend at least three-fourths of our time, my team does, addressing that issue today um, from, from integration, but also we still have to look long term too and look at how do we, how do we look at that problem set. So that's just kind of a garden variety of, of my inbox uh, on, on a daily or a weekly and a monthly basis. Um, you know, I, I, I posed this question at you, and I had a very senior leader, and I won't, I won't say who it was, and we were in a room, and we were talking about counter UAS. And uh, it, was a, yeah, it, was a, it was a session we had in the building, and we, we laid out some footage that was on YouTube and some open source reporting that showed some overflights of uh, unmanned aerial systems at bases and stations, and this stuff's captured. You can pull it up and pull it UAS flyovers or whatever. And he posed the question, this is a four-star senior ranking individual, he said, do we really have air superiority anymore? And so while we're looking at things right now in today's discussion about missile defense, you've got to really talk about the A component in IAMD and how that's really being very disruptive in, in today's fight. Um, and so, as I stated earlier, the, the challenge is, and all of these gentlemen said it, is striking what is that right balance between resources and, and very finite resources, money, funding, you name it, and balancing what do we need today and mortgaging for tomorrow. Um, because that's, that's, that's where we, that's the challenge that we run into. We can look at the long lead times of initial capability uh, development documents out there, ICDs. But then I have to address the warfighter needs of today of joint emerging operational needs as well as um, joint, joint urgent and emerging needs from the combatant commanders, so GEONs and GEONs. I was trying to be careful about my acronyms here, so I'll explain all that to you. Um, and we have to address those in the near term. And so when things are happening, we can't say, hey, wait for the normal JSIDS process of five to ten years in, to, in order to deliver capability to you. They need it in 12 or 24 months, in some cases a lot sooner when, when it's a clear and present danger and we have soldiers and sailors, airmen, marines in harm's way and potentially in, uh, you know, dying. So those are things that we have to 
balance each day in the building and how we look at uh, you know, the, the, the FIDEP, how we look at the POM, and how we look at how the administration is, is prioritizing these efforts out there. Um, but then we also have to pay attention to a lot of great concepts here. But we have to look at DOTMIL PF and how do you integrate doctrine? How do you integrate manning? How do you integrate training into all of this right here and all these great ideas out there? It take, still takes a man or a woman on the other end of that button to train, man, and equip, as well as integrate, grow the Army, grow that service, grow that capability to deliver those systems into the, uh, into the force. And so that's, that's something that's always challenging. We have to look at that. We have to look at where do we hedge bets? Where, do, where can we buy time? Where can we mortgage time? And, or where do we have to rush and get that capability to the field sooner? And so we're always, we're always faced with how do you deal between readiness and, and, and modernization. Because, um, you know, the technology threat, the enemy gets a vote, we've heard that tons of time, and you have budget instability, competing priorities, and all of these really changed the calculus. You know, in 2012, when I was a sitting brigade commander sitting in a CENTCOM region, it was great. It was all things I ran. So I had everything I needed over there, and I was getting funded, I was getting assistance, I had all the help that I need. Now the paradigm has shifted. Obviously, it's, it's all things North Korea. What does that mean for CENTCOM? How do we balance the force and how do we balance the combatant commanders? How do we still balance Europe with the, with the competitive threat of Russia over there? So that's used as an example, but that's, that's how we have, to, we have to look at the world. Um, you know, if you look at the Army, once again, I'll just use the Army as an example, and you look at funding, Army's very people-centric. It's not platform-centric. So rough order of magnitude, the Army's budget is, it pays 50% of it goes towards personnel, entitlements. We've got to pay our troops. We've got to pay their entitlements, you name it. That leaves about 30% for readiness. And we've heard about readiness being non-negotiable. And then that sl slithers you down to maybe 20%, if you're lucky, for rdt and &E and modernization. So once again, and then, oh, by the way, we're, we're talking a lot about missile defense. One briefing I had to present to the, uh, to the chairman yesterday was on close combat. All right, I'm the air defender, but I happen to be the ground guy in the J-8, so guess what? Tag, you're going to, to briefly uh, talk about this Army program, or, or Army and Marine, and how do, we, how do we meet the Secretary of Defense's priority here for close combat? <clears throat> and so if that's one of his priorities, and you have long-range precision fires, you have things out there, and we talked about how do we get to the fight, how's the battlefield going to look, how's the environment going to look, how's the contemporary environment going to look when we get there, it's not just us, it's a joint environment. So we're competing a bit against these other demands out there. So we have 15 Patriot Battalions in the Army. At any given time, eight or nine of them are committed. So it's not a one-for-one -one dwell out there that you can say, hey, you know what, let's bring them back and we can reset. We still got to modernize that equipment. We have seven THAAD batteries. We have, uh, we have a threat out there that continues to emerge and get better. So how do we keep pace with that? I love hearing the story from Vince when he talked about the uh, the desert storm scenario. I was the guy sitting in a peanut patch in Israel watching 42 Scuds coming in Israel going through that change of patches that was happening on the fly. So that's great when we have men and women scientists and engineers that are that are working those things fast. But some things don't don't happen that quick and so that goes into the challenge that we have to deal with um, through the department and the lens that we see. And I'm talking certainly Army, we could talk about carriers, we could talk about F-35s, we could talk about all sorts of platforms out there that are competing in today's environment and why one is more important than the other. And what could one influence the other? And so that's the hard discussion that we have to have lots of times in the building. Now, I will represent with, with my air defense expertise that slither of the pie, but I still have to come back and understand uh, the full magnitude and the full, so the full spectrum of the problem as we, as we uh, deal with this. Um, you know, I, I, I got to get back to this dot mil PF thing because, you know, the, the scenario I, I, I use, my son's been driving for a little over a year now, but I couldn't hand him the car keys when he was five or six years old. It took him about 15 years to really say, okay, you got enough maturity for me to allow you to get a, get a permit and then get a license for me to trust you to go to school. And that's the same with our weapon systems. Okay, these kids don't just come in a box and we, sh we ship them out and we put them into some very high-tech capability. It takes a lot to really season a really good operator. And we talk a lot about what goes into building a pilot. The same goes into building an operator for any of these missile defense systems. I will submit that the, uh, I can certainly talk about the Army, but the Navy, the Air Force, whoever is manning a workstation out there or a station out there is just as critical. 
And so, once again, you got to put that in perspective when we start talking about do we, do we make it easier for them, potentially, that's good. If we can make the, the man station a lot more user friendly, a lot more Xbox or whatever they're using, Wii friendly, that's great. All right, but if we're talking about some very high science and we want to make sure we don't have fratricide out there and we talk about uh, missile conservation and all those things that we were just discussing earlier, uh, then that becomes the challenge. And that takes a lot of time to really understand that environment and going through a couple turns out there in the, uh, out there in the deployed environment. And so, you know, we've got to keep up with doctrine and policies, et cetera, there. The, uh, you know, and then we talked about the, the layered defense. Sustaining a layered missile defense is not easy. Once again, it's hard. You can't leave people out there 365, 10 years straight or whatever. And that's the, that's the balance. And certainly what missile defense does give you potentially is some of that A2AD access, okay, that anti-access denial type um, shaping operations as you bring these, as you, as you can bring forces to, the, to bear sooner if you have that missile defense envelope potentially forward deployed. And how long can, and you're right, they're sitting ducks. I guarantee you, you can go on any Google site out there and you can probably find each of our Patriot batteries as they are stationed in Korea or in the CENTCOM AOR or whatever. And, and it's probably not that hard to, to understand where they're at. Um, so I like the discussion of let's, let's integrate what we have now. Let's integrate Patriot and THAAD. Let's integrate Patriot, THAAD, and Aegis. Let's integrate as we move forward with IBCS. That's important. That's important. We have to get behind that, and we have to understand it's not just maybe the hardware, but it's the non-material thought that goes behind that and understanding we have to get there, and we have to figure out what your role is, what your mission is, and how are you going to contribute to, uh, to getting us there sooner. Um, we, we have to continue to build partnership capacity. Uh, we've got to break down the stovepipes. What can we share with host nation? Where can they pick up the, I don't like to say the word burden, because I would tell you right now, the Emirates and the Saudi Arabian uh, Patriot forces are probably the most experienced in the world today. They are sitting behind manned stations and screens, and they are hitting the, the engage button. So they feel the pucker factor that we haven't felt in a very long time if you were wearing a Patriot suit or if you're wearing a Thad suit out there. You may have gone and done some live fires out there in White Sands Missile Range or out in Kwajalein. But knowing that if this threat, if I don't hit this, people are actually going to die and it's going to change the environment out there. We need to get in their heads and we need to understand people that are doing this for a living on a daily basis. And I believe that's very important. And then the, the last thing is we've got to refresh the IMD vision. All right? And we, and, and we talked about the MDR. It's on hold right now. We have a new policy undersecretary that has just come on board and, and he wants to put a stamp on it. That's the frank truth right there. And, so, and, that's, and that's good. <clears throat> he, he, he should look at this very hard. Uh, the goodness is we, we've had a lot of gains, particularly over the summer, as we look at the $4.6 billion increase um, to improve some of the capacity out there, GBI and things like that, to improve our, our, uh, our structure in, in, in today's environment because of the importance that all of these gentlemen explained just a few minutes ago of understanding we have to start moving on at that right away. Um, the, the, the last thing I'll say, and this is more personal, is, uh, you know, you still, have, you still have the human element. This is high op-tempo business, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we, we talk about this very plug and play. We talk about systems being out there. They can't be left in an, in an autonomous role. There still is a man and woman that is deploying for a year at a time, coming back, maybe for 12, maybe 24 months if they're lucky, and they're turning around and doing it again. They have families, they have wives and husbands, they have to train, they have to go to school, and how do we, and, and it takes, as I described earlier, how long it takes to, to train them and get them proficient and get that experience, and after a while, they get tired. And so we, we, we have to think of this not, you know, very holistically, not just in a variable of material, but the non-material and the intangible that's associated with uh, the soldier, sailor, airman, marine that's doing the nation's bidding. So I just, I always feel it's important to kind of kind of close with that. It's not, it's not gloom and doom, but it's certainly something that we have to uh, understand. We're sending Patriot forces downrange right now at between 75 and 8 percent strength, um, because once again, the op tempo and 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 not not having the uh, the full complement of personnel that's assigned to these organizations. And I can speak only for the Army. I'm I'm certain. 
uh, Marine and Air Force has, uh, has, has equal challenges. So I appreciate that. I just kind of want to lay out a few things from the, from the operator's perspective, but also how uh, we, we, we hear the ear of the, the, the Secretary of Defense as well as the Chairman. So, so thanks a lot, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much for all your thorough thoughts here. Um, you know, as Tom said, it's, it's time to think differently about missile defense and to sort of chart a new course. And we have a missile defense strategy on the horizon. Um, and also, General Dickinson mentioned that the Army is in the process of uh, redoing their strategy um, to come out this summer. So it seems like a good time to you know, start thinking in imaginative ways. So this is a question for all of you on the panel, whoever wants to weigh in can. Um, you know, what are some of the imaginative ways that we can shape our missile defense architecture that aligns with the new defense strategy? And specifically, how can we take what we already have and do new imaginative, imaginative things with it um, in order to get after um, you know, a more robust missile defense architecture that can go up against near-peer adversaries? Hmm. So I guess I'll uh, lead off on this one. As the one of the offices responsible for the uh, the imagination piece, um, I have to say the the article did a really great job of um, of trying to lay out a vision for um, some for both a uh, practical as well as an um, uh, an imaginative uh, type of uh, missile defense architecture. Um, so an example here is, unfortunately, our adversaries have in many ways been um, providing uh, some of the lead on the imagination front, if you will. Uh, and that's somewhat unfortunate. It really speaks to how long it's been since the United States has done some real soul searching on the IAMD front. You know, we've kind of allowed our adversaries to get ahead of us in many ways. If you look at things like, for example, the Russian Club K, where they have a containerized missile launching system. Um, that's it. And, and the inherent obfuscation that uh, that, that provides, that's one you know, very imaginative way that we could certainly uh, look to um, uh, expanding the, uh, our IAMD system. However, I want to approach the, the answer from a <coughs> fundamentally different perspective. Uh, as the, uh, I'm a former DARPA PM, I'm now a SCO PM, the imagination part is actually the easy part. It's easy for us, I like to refer to us as propeller heads, it's easy for us propeller heads to think of all kinds of cutesy, uh, imaginative, really cool, novel ways that we can go do new things. Um, and I'm going to now that I'm no longer a DARPA PM, I can kind of I can speak to um, where I think DARPA sort of needs to be in a bit of a box. Uh, and I love DARPA; I truly love it. It's, it. It is a national treasure. But DARPA has, on many occasions, tried to be very directly connected with operations, and I think that's one of the dumbest things that we can try to do. Um, we need a very strong filter and a process between the propeller heads and operations. And we've had some very dramatic fails on that front. So as Art was saying, and I agree completely, when we talk about things like containerized systems, we have to think through what is the command and control structure for it, and in particular, not just whose finger is on the button, under what circumstances what uh, are we going to push the button, but when you talk about things like you know, the back of the Kmart or Walmart parking lot or you know, various places, the back of the Maersk ship, how do we know no one happens to be standing in harm's way as that thing launches? Uh, so the uh, imagination is great, but really there's kind of a rubber meets the road aspect. Right? So we have to pass some of these um, <coughs> interesting concepts through the filter of operations, working hand in hand, and that's one of the things that we do in SCO. Um, we, every single project that we work, we start from day one, hand in hand with our transition partners. So this way we have the uh, kind of that reality filter, if you will, on some of these interesting concepts that we come up with, how are they best employed? Um, we have realism brought to that command and control structure. And the, and the whole transition architecture for some of those imaginative concepts. So 
while I think it's great to think in terms of what kind of imaginative, imaginative novel ideas can we come up with for how we can modify or bring our IAMD architecture into the, into the future, we really need to think in also in terms of what's the, what's the right process for doing that, what's the filter, how do we do it effectively so that we're not simply pouring money down a drain that, or, or investing in technologies that simply have no transition path associated with them uh, because they're just not implementable in the C2 sense. That's my two cents hole. I think the interesting thing to consider would be working from the other direction and going from some of the stuff that General Coward was talking about was to take the time, uh, the money, and the very senior leadership support to do the wargaming on the what ifs. If I had this, that, and the other thing, how would I use it? If I had that scenario, how would I use it? And too often those kinds of efforts tend to, all the voltage goes to ground on a bright, shiny object. And people want to talk about how long, how fast, how far, and how high said object should be, rather than say, we'll simply postulate a set of capabilities, whether it's certain lasers, certain interceptors, whether they be gun launched, missile launched, um, and to say, OK, from an operational and a command point of view, how would you use this and what are the implications of doing it? Um, it's not just making sure no one's you know, taking a smoke break in the Walmart parking lot when this thing has to go, but if you have 50 of these around, how do you decide which one to use and when to use it? And do I use an HGV on this instead of a THAD? And what is the long-term implications of that? So this is, I think what needs to be done is an effort to say, okay, these are all things that we know we've needed to do. We've known we've needed them for a long time. I try not to be too much of a pessimist, but um, I also go back to Desert Storm and I look at what our IAMD capability in Desert Storm and what it is today, some 25 years later, and I'm not horribly impressed. So to take the time to do the, the conceptual doctrine, um, C2 organizational um, wargaming, to then start to s understand what you would need to do to these systems to employ them effectively, what systems would be used where and when sort of as a way to connect to the user. Mm -hmm. But with all due respect to SCO or DARPA, if we're going to do this on a joint and integrated basis, you've got too many organizations involved. So you're going to have to have the money, the time, and the pull, whether it comes from SecDef or the chairman or whoever, to go to General Dickinson and say, you will give me these people. To go to Dr. Roper and say, you will give me these people to go to Admiral Small at Aegis and say, you will give me these people. Mm -hmm. And to start to work this as perhaps a cross-functional team of some sort to figure out how we really start to put this stuff together. As an integrated product team. As an integrated product team. I avoided that intentionally because that sounds too much like an acquisition function. This is not an acquisition function. It's not a requirements function. It's a warfighting conceptual development function. Mm -hmm. You have an affection for Walmart. I do indeed. Or, or, you, or you don't like it's it. It's all about Walmart. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have too much imagination because I certainly, I, 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 frankly speaking, it's just, it's just a reality that we live. And, and so certainly, as I, as I mentioned before, sen sensors are important. Um, where, where can I either descope either the manning requirement for some of these large organizations that are required to be forward deployed? And so as I kind of close the, the, uh, the end of my discussion, that's sort of where the, at, the, uh, the imagination goes for me when I look at, okay, hey, if this is going to continue to be on the forefront, we're going to continue to be doing this over the next 10, 20, 30 years, and we're not going to grow end strength tremendously. We're not going to increase experience overnight. Where can I fight from home? Where can I fight and disperse? Where can I provide that? You know, we talk a little critical of, of C2, but, but there's some positive aspects of 
the, the non-material C2 um, just based on the fact that we, in the world that we live right now. And so if you had General Ganey here from, from the 94 AMDC in the Pacific, uh, it's been force-fed. Um, if you've lived in the CENTCOM region, certainly over the last 27, yeah. eight years or whatever, it's been force-fed and so we've had to adapt. And, um, but at the same time, sometimes we, we do slip back and we kind of get comfortable really with some of just the, the boxes and workstations that currently exist and we don't continue to press the needle. I'll, I'll be frank about Patriot Thad integration. I was a captain in 1994 when I saw the first Thad battery, or 95, roll out on a parade field at Fort Bliss when it was just in a kind of an IOTE phase. And, you know, that's, whatever, do the math, almost 28 years, 24 years ago. And so why are we just now starting to try to figure that out right now? We're getting there. We're going to get there too. And, and same within, you know, how we're, how we're pushing the IBCS. But as, you know, we just never really thought of it in, in this construct because, once again, the nature of war, we, we, we slipped back into a coin operation for almost 15 years. And now we're coming back out of that into the decisive action. So imagination to me is a little bit more close to currently what, what, can, we, what can we fix in the, in the, in the near term. Um, and then we can start figuring out the other things down the road. Thank you. I guess to, to follow up on that, you know, does Jamdo or any other organizations you know, need to change in order to get the you know, imaginative and possibly promising ideas you know, onto the tracks, onto the operational tracks yeah. um, at a pace which we need to be on to get after a missile defense architecture yeah, that we, can go up against. And certainly from, from Arch days to my days, I mean, we really have had to scope what is it we can really do. And, and so we have to be the interlocker of the agencies that I discussed before between OSD, MDA, DARPA, SCO, you name it, and we have to stay abreast there. And we have to kind of have major, two major focuses, war fighting requirements, short term and long term, and certainly uh, studies and analysis. So I didn't talk a lot about that, but that's a, it's a major component that we do when we try to look at you know, what, is the, what does it look like in the out years? Um, and we got to commit funding to that too. And we, and we do so, and sometimes it's not enough, but we do so because we, we need to get these things in the labs. We have to um, get in the labs of, of, of some other folks out there, whether it be Johns Hopkins, Georgia Tech, uh, DARPA, you name it, um, and have them look a, take a hard look at this and, uh, and stay abreast there. So, you know, that's, that's how I have to look at the glass half full. Organization drew down probably about 70%, you know, over the last uh, <clears throat> couple, you know, couple of years here. So um, it is what it is. We're still as relevant and busy and uh, important to the chairman and the secretary. Um, but that's kind of how we have to really scope ourselves when we, when we look at this. But with that uh, drawdown that JIM does experience, particularly, I think, with the budget, um, what has the impact been on being able to carry out you know, future plans for missile defense? Yeah, I, I, I think you know, we've had to pull away from things looking at the architecture. We have to pull away from the doctrine uh, piece that we were heavily invested in over, certainly over the years and probably from, from March days. Um, we, we are more tangentially a piece of the MDR process versus leading it when, when Art was leading it, when he was, Arch was leading it when he was there. <laughs> a few years ago and so you, you just have to walk a few more miles each day certainly in the rings of the pentagon and just touch more people and kind of go a little bit more not not deep into a silo but just go more of an inch deep and a mile wide and, and stay in a breast and so that's that's kind of what we had to do and i think we're doing a good job of it because i got i got great folks that work uh, still in the organization okay. so i think general coward really hit the uh the, the nail on the head we have to commit funding and the problem is in this era of diminishing budgets, year over year diminishing budgets, we end up functioning in a very myopic manner. And I'm not, I'm not maligning anyone here. It's just, it's, it's the reality of the situation. Um, instead of taking a uh, kind of a bottoms up approach where we say, we're going to look at our current IAMD architecture and we're going to, we're going to re-architect it for the future. We're going to re-architect it from the bottom up. The very first, the pushback that you're going to get, and I'm sure General Coward knows this all too, all, all too painfully, um, the pushback you're going to get is, yeah, where's the money going to come for that? So what we end up doing is deciding, you know, we, we've got GBIs. How many more GBIs can we afford to build? We take this top-down approach. Um, we've got this much money. How many of this can we buy? How many of that can we buy? And it becomes very myopic. What we, we really need to take a step back. We need to be able to... Um, really re-engineer from the bottom up and it involves future threat, you know, current threats, future threats, 
capabilities, really everything <coughs> that's in Tom's report, but, and, and, and a whole lot more. Uh, and, and really and go back to Congress and say, we have a choice here. We can either have an effective defense or we can continue inching along the way that we are with our heads in the sand saying it's going to be ballistic missiles coming from this axis at that elevation and heaven forbid anybody throws anything different at us. Right. And I'll just say real quick, uh, without going further into the imagination, uh, I think it's the dispersal principle that really was the idea behind all this. It came from the distributed lethality thing, but even if you're just talking about the ballistic side, mm -hmm. nobody yet has mentioned transportable GBIs. They won't fit in a 40-foot cargo container, but you move that around, it buys battle space, and it also hedges against the uncertainty of where things might be coming from. And so whatever the interceptor or effector is, I think it's the dispersal principle. Uh, that b the more we get away from strictly ballistic threats, the more that's going to come into. And frankly, that's a little bit, uh, you know, going back to the future. I the air defense architectures, from, you know, from the 1960s and what have you, they were much more dispersed. They were, they were all over the place. We weren't trying to do everything from Alaska or from an LRDR or something like that. We're all over the place. Okay. Um, I know we've been uh, going for about an hour and a half here, so I want to open up uh, to the audience. Uh, anyone who has a question? Um, Sydney? <laughs> Hi. Uh, Sydney Friedberg, Breaking Defense. Particularly looking uh, from a SCO perspective, you mentioned that you, you're working on not just the projectile, but also you know, the sense, some sensors go along with that. You know, how are you working on the concepts and the command and control, which other people have talked about with for other systems, for fitting HVP into, uh, you know, both the wider missile defense and the wider fires? Because as you say, it potentially could turn all sorts of things that are not even on that, you know, game board now into uh, important playing pieces, and that requires some way to actually make use of them. Yes, that's a great question. Um, when uh, I, my programmatic approach, my program management approach, is really to define what is the key nugget, the key technology nugget that we're going after. This is an RDT&E approach, right? Um, so when I came on board, I took over the uh, HDWS program uh, maybe a year or two in. The, uh, I, I defined the goal of the program to demonstrate that we can get a maneuvering projectile sufficiently proximate to an inbound maneuvering threat that with a suitably capable warhead, we can successfully engage and defeat that threat. We are building out the full fire control loop, including the sensors, the comms links, the projectile, the, the launchers, the guns, um, where appropriate, the Navy gun we're, we're not uh, modifying, the Army gun, we're moving to the extended range cannon artillery. Um, we're building out all of those pieces. However, as far as the command and control, and that's an excellent question, I leave that to my independent transition partners, Navy and Army. So IWS will, de will decide uh, what is the command and control architecture. Does this get integrated and in, does it, we're integrated in, into Mark 160. Does it stay integrated into Mark 160? Does it get integrated into Aegis? Um, same on the Army side. Uh, we've talked about IBCS, there's some challenges there. Uh, it, it's really up to my Army transition partners to decide what that command and control is. What I'm setting out to do is demonstrate the fundamentally new capability and provide them with all the pieces that they need to transition that into EMD. And in EMD, they will resolve those, uh, those challenges. Um, you'll note that along the way, I had some weasel wording in there with a suitably capable warhead. We have a warhead that'll be flying on the round that we'll be demonstrating. But this is not fundamentally a warhead program. We've built warheads before. I need to demonstrate that we can get within a lethal mist distance of the target. And that's the, that's the key technology that we're setting out to demonstrate. I don't believe that it's in my wheelhouse to tell my operational transition partners how they're going to use this, what their command and control structure needs to be, or how it gets integrated into it. It's really up to them to do that. And how close are you to that demo, which meets your requirements, if not, you know, I'm a miracle weapon that will work on day one. So. I'm sorry, can you repeat? How do you get to that, that 
how far away from, the, from doing the demo will you get within that critical miss distance? Uh, and then it can start transitioning. Hmm. Well, let me answer that in a roundabout sense. Um, my program ends less than a year from now. Yes. Yes, up here in the front. Uh, thank you. Um, two uh, critical dimensions, one that Admiral Macy mentioned and you just brought up, the, and Sydney brought up, the idea of um, how this would be used in war fighting. The other thing is the development of the underlying technologies that would enable any of these distributed things. And what I'm referring to there, of course, is the extension of radar range, which you mentioned, the uh, increasing acceleration of the speed of radar signal processing to better earlier detect, detect and track, and then reduction of latency in communication by eliminating, mitigating interference in forms of noise, clutter, debris, and jamming. Uh, as these technologies are required to make these distributed concepts work, how are you advancing to improve that technology? How am I looking at Advancing, how are you moving advancing? forward? I mean, given you have less than a year, you have a lot to solve. But I mean, in other words, these are technologies. You cannot <coughs> do any of these. In other words, these are systems that require early detection, longer, uh, gives you more time to shoot, right? Or mm -hmm. shoot several times. You need to speed, accelerate your radar signal processing so you establish a detect earlier than at present and a detect and track earlier than present. And uh, fourthly, of course, once you do that, once you have your track that you're going to shoot against or your target looking down, uh, reduce the delay, the latency <coughs> of communication, which could be um, problematic in many ways because of various forms of interference, uh, i.e. noise, clutter, debris, or jamming. So what are you working on the basic technologies that enable these visions? Boy, um, I'd say... Uh we, we really need to spend the next couple of hours and several beers um, <laughs> somewhere nearby, but to try to answer that in some sort of compact manner. Uh, we do have an end-to-end -end spec that addresses things like latency, throughput, that sort of thing. Um, and at the, uh, at the individual component level, we obviously try to optimize those pieces. The, uh, we have, um, <clears throat> how to tackle this one? We have on a, uh, as far as the uh, radar protection is concerned, uh, we have some very good consultants, uh, Georgia Tech on board, who's helping us in that regard. And I think that's probably about all I can say uh, as far as how we're <coughs> approaching that, that end-to-end -end, uh, latency challenge. And I, I apologize for the vagueness there. All right, anyone else? Justin? Hey, thank you. Justin Doubleday with Inside Defense. I um, just wanted to ask, if the Defense Department were to take on you know, more of this integrated IAMD approach that you're all talking about. It seems like right now it's kind of ad hoc and who's doing what piece of it. Um, and, and of course, MDA's mission is to go after ballistic missiles um, in all phases of attack, but, or all phases of the, the flight. But um, should MDA's mission be broadened in that case, if, if they were to take on this IAMD mission, or who, who would it, who would lead in the, in this area? Who would who would take on the RDT and E and kind of push forward here? Yeah, it, it's not as ad hoc as you, you might appear, might appear to be. Um, the goodness with Miss Ellen Lord coming on as the AT and L soon to take on her her split role here in the next month or so. She's reinstituted and really re-energized the missile defense executive board process that brings in all of the stakeholders uh, from the joint staff, uh, from OSD, from MDA and from the services. Uh, and so we, we, we have certain priorities and topics that, that come to bear. And, and we have, you know, Frank, the, uh, you know, the behind the doors discussion. Um, 
you know, and, and if we can continue to model how we all came together this summer, summer, particularly during, you know, the heightened crisis in North Korea and the president's urgency to, um, or to get the, the uh, plan over to OMB in order to, what we were going to buy with the increase of the presidential funding, uh, I think we're on pretty solid footing when it comes to establishing what those priorities are. And we get everybody in the room, we have a discussion with Comptroller, we have a discussion with the operators, and we have a discussion with the services, and we lay those out um, aligned with the, the, the guiding documents from, from, our, from our leadership as well as combatant commands. And so while it may appear at times to not have that look as fluid, it is, uh, there is some method to the madness, uh, particularly for my foxhole, and so I see it in the building uh, from the joint staff. So. Anyone else? All right. Well, thank you so much for, for your time today, gentlemen. Um, looks like you may not have to go back to the Pentagon. No, now. no. <laughs> we're going to slow roll, right? <laughs> thank you, Jeff. Well, thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Um, thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.